This is a question for Giant, for you. This is spelled Giant, is that right? <laughs> this, was, this was a very depressing description of India, uh, in a way. I, I, I cannot judge whether it's, you know, whether it's really 100% like that or, or not. I, I believe, of course, that, that you know this country and this, uh, this, this, this attitude. And then you compare this, this, this bad uh, situation over there with the good one in, 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 in Britain, Great Britain. And, I may, and then you mentioned um, that some principles you met over there in England that had to do, that, that are connected with human rights, civiliza civilization and things like that, that that's missing over there in India. Now, is it, is it missing because India is not yet in this stage? Or maybe that was put there maybe by the British Empire uh, within the colonial uh, structure and afterwards went off again? Or is it something that is also inbuilt in humans and by some maybe statist or other reasons that went lost in India? Sorry, firstly you said that it was depressing. It was not supposed to be depressing. Uh, I actually wanted more time to speak about this issue, uh, but of course there's limitation on, uh, on what, what, all that I could say. Um, I should have made it very clear that uh, uh, India is what it is. You can do nothing about it. Uh, Western mind considers this to be depressing. And there are no proper words to define these things because I said that India is an amoral country. I did not say it is an immoral country. Uh, amorality means that they don't have the concept of morality. You become immoral if you, have the con if you know that there is something called morality. So similarly, Indians can't differentiate between depravities and non-depravities. They just don't differentiate those things. So it is not depressing, it is just uh, I have to use Western words, um, and if you use Western words, it looks depressing, but India is what it is. You can do nothing about it. Uh, now, English were God sent to India. They were, they were the people who tried to create a civilization in that country. Um, the, the concept of human rights are never a part of that society. They don't get it. They simply don't have the values to absorb the concept of human rights of, or any of the other Western values, like honor, loyalty, truthfulness. They simply don't get it. If you talk about these things, they will laugh at you. So uh, British tried to inculcate those values in Indians, uh, and they made a very small dent in that country over a period of 300 years. So they created an improvement in that country uh, but that improvement has worn off over the last 76 years of so-called independence because a bunch of junkies, brain-dead people have come to rule that country. So things have deteriorated. Now, uh, I lived in the United Kingdom 30 years back. People knew this thing better those days. What has happened in these three decades is that political correctness has erased a wisdom that Western people had about the third world. Uh, otherwise, three decades back, they really understood a lot of these things, but political correctness have really uh, corrupted, uh, uh, you know, blinded Western people about many things to do with the third world. Uh, I have a question for uh, Sean Gab. Um, it was a very good uh, introduction to the fall of the uh, Roman uh, Republic. Uh, especially in very synthetic kind of way. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> then the title says, what if anything to learn from it today? And you finished with war and empire. So I'm thinking there could be some application to the United States. But I just do not see a Julius Caesar rising from the ranks of the army in the United States and saving it uh, for a few more centuries, starting a dynasty. 
microphone here, but I'll talk through this one. I think this microphone is for the recording, this is speaking. Um, yes, Olivier. What I, what I think I was saying was that the circumstances of a country determine its constitution. Rome functioned very well with a republican constitution when it was, and it, when it was a city-state in central Italy. The moment it became the center of a great Mediterranean empire, that constitution became more or less unworkable. Indeed, if you look at the map, or if you think of a map of the Roman Empire, you can see that it is a vast geographical expanse, and the only way in which that empire can be held efficiently together is by a monarchy of some kind. Rome was lucky in that, although we can condemn many of the actions of Julius Caesar, Caesar was a great man, a man with vision, and he was there to pick up the pieces of the constitutional structure that he ultimately did nothing to break. And although Caesar was murdered before he could begin to put everything back together, Rome was extraordinarily lucky to have Caesar's great nephew, Octavian, who did come along and put together a workable next step in Roman history. The workable next step was to announce that the constitution was fully restored, and but that Augustus was now the first citizen. A very successful fraud, a very successful constitutional fraud. Now, Will America be this lucky? And I'm not entirely sure of that. What I can say is that the United States Constitution worked very well as the constitution of a North American Republic, but has not worked terribly well as the constitution of a great empire that is almost continuously at war since I don't, see that the, I don't see the Americans as very likely to give up on imperialism or war in the short term, it may be useful to consider what will be the next step in American constitutional practice. Um, I'd have a few remarks regarding Rahim's talk and uh, Switzerland, since I'm also an Austrian Austrian who moved to Switzerland a few years ago. I mean, generally, I, I agree, but I think a few points I'd, I'd like to add. You probably will not disagree with them. Um, so, number one, the structural difference when it comes to the, the governance system, I think, will bring Switzerland a long-term relative uh, advantage relative to the EU surrounding, surrounding Switzerland. Um, you, I think, didn't mention also uh, Swiss franc, so the, the strong currency, which obviously is helping the competitiveness on a, on a structural base. And uh, also, I think, in terms of savings, when it comes to the pension system, Swiss, Switzerland is in way much better shape than Germany and Austria, for instance. Um, entrepreneurial spirit, I'd say, is generally also higher than in the surrounding countries. So I, I agree with that Switzerland is also in an absolute term on, on a downward trajectory. But I, I think the point you made, it's like five to ten years behind, say, Austria. I don't think it's like it will be a, a linear path where it's just like following this decay in the same kind of way because of these kind of structural factors, for instance, which I just mentioned. I think the relative disparity will, will actually grow. I think the, the downfall will be slower, perhaps because of some of these factors, than, uh, than a linear downfall. That would be my point. Yeah, I, I never believe in linear lines, of course, as an Austrian economist in particular. But uh, let me challenge you on the few points. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, good points uh, made. So, what's the first one? The structure. Uh, where I, I think the main uh, advantage of the structure is it slows down things. Uh, I think one of the impo most important inheritances was, uh, of course, uh, modern Switzerland with its structure was the result of a coup d'etat. 
uh, like like the, the U.S. Uh, thing where they forced uh, the minority of Cantons uh, to become part of a new structure uh, and uh, to get a cons as a concession, as the U.S. Uh, Constitution had to give a concession to the anti-federalists, of course, with whom I sympathize more, and I'd sympathize more uh, with, with those Cantons not willing to join into a centralized uh, Switzerland. Uh, the main concession was the referendum, for example, and still these days I think it, it's one of the tools that slows down. Sometimes it, it looks like it, it, it brings uh, uh, results, but usually, uh, I mean, the kind of pseudo democracy we have in most Western countries is that you can have a party uh, behind which maybe like five to seven percent of the electorate is standing and they are able to destroy a country by enforcing policies because they're just part of government, they have the minister and so on. So, so with Switzerland, you can take some issues and make them a referendum and then it's not five to seven percent of the population that can push uh, uh, some crazy policies uh, through, but there's a kind of, of veto if enough people uh, show up and sign. And that has slowed down a lot of things, so I think that's the most positive thing about the structure, but still it's a quite quite defensive thing. And the structure has changed a lot, of course, there is very, and, and David Durer has talked about that uh, a lot and written about it, how it has changed, how little actually democratic impact of, of Swiss is on major decisions. Uh, uh, very few valleys left where you have the Landsgemeinde and, and, and where it's left, it, it's never about relevant uh, decisions uh, usually. Uh, so they, the structure has changed a lot, but still it's slowing things down. Second thing was the Swiss franc. Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately, um, it's just a relative thing. So uh, what the Swiss Central Bank has been doing is trying to uh, produce as many Swiss francs as possible to keep the exchange rate not uh, uh, like like uh, getting up too much. Uh, uh, and so they are following sweet uh, because, of course, there's the pressure from the export industry and so on. So for a while, the Swiss uh, uh, National Bank was the biggest shareholder in Facebook or Meta. And you see, like, they produce Swiss franc and buy stupid dollar assets and stupid euro assets. I mean, who would now invest in, in, in Germany and parts like that? Uh, I mean, there can be some good reasons. <laughs> well, I take anyone, but uh, the Swiss National Bank uh, buying euro and dollar assets, of course, just to bring down the Swiss franc and then keep it within the range. Still, relatively speaking, but the main reason is like other people leaving the euro and selling off dollar and euro assets, uh, uh, but it's not because the Swiss franc has a very sound structure. Uh, um, uh, it, it, I mean, it was the last currency that had some semblance of a gold-based thing, but that ended. Uh, it's not too long ago, but actually it took the decision uh, to, to uh, break the link uh, to gold and what they did. And of course, what was the idea behind it? It was politicians looking at inert billions uh, of money and they just took it <laughs> out as a, and then they discussed for a while what to spend it on and then how much good they could do with the <laughs> money. But that happened, that has happened. So gold has been demonetized in Switzerland uh, uh, as well and it's a fiat currency as ev every other one. It's just, uh, it's just relatively better. Switzerland is relatively smaller, relatively more stable. <laughs> uh, so that's the, the main advantage of the Swiss franc. And of course, it's competition. So of course, we very, have to be very thankful that the franc is not part of the euro and they haven't given up of the euro because that puts pressure on the euro. But just by the Swiss franc being a bit slower <laughs> in depreciating. Uh, uh, so uh, I think there were two other points. I don't want to speak too long. But oh. Yeah, okay, yeah, the industry, yeah, of course, uh, of course, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of the, uh, as, as no Austrian economist, I think, is a fan of, like, you have to neither have a weak currency, and it's great for your industry. Uh, no, I think Switzerland shows that, uh, but still, I think Swiss franc is too weak, <laughs> and it should be even stronger, which most Swiss would consider crazy, but what would have happened if the Swiss franc was really strong, or there would still be a gold franc? Of course, the Swiss would be much closer to their potential, which is like te being 10 times as rich as everyone else, and they'd be the investors. Uh, uh, and uh, I think there's too little of that. If you had a really strong Swiss franc, of course, the Swiss would own a much higher proportion as productive assets and be much stronger investors on the market. And then maybe not produce everything that's labor-intensive in Switzerland, but own 
the facilities that are labor intensive elsewhere, uh, and I think it still would have been better uh, for Swiss industry or uh, the economic structure of Switzerland as well. Uh, the more entrepreneurial spirit, yes, of course, but it's also a result of the influx uh, of people, and it has been from, from the beginning. I mean, I, I mentioned this Alpine base that was there, but without the Huguenots coming in first, uh, and then all layers of, of uh, immigrants that drove the industry, and the Huguenots drove, of course, the watch industry, the textile industry, the two most important industries were immigrant-driven uh, industries, uh, not saying that they are not entrepreneurial Swiss, but the big challenge about the Swiss is not that they are too entrepreneurial in any way, it's they lack enterprise because wealth, fiat wealth in particular, uh, it's, it's uh, such an appealing lifestyle, and we see it in Liechtenstein, I think it's even worse. It's like every Liechtensteinian can, can work for a trust here and, and just sign papers all day long and have a good salary, uh, so there's not that much need to really be visionary and a pioneer, and I see the same problem, of course, uh, in, in Switzerland. I would love to see much more vision and much more pioneering entrepreneurial spirit. Of course, it's it's better, but if the entrepreneurs and more and more entrepreneurs are leaving Germany and, and go to Switzerland, then of course, uh, let's hope for even more coming, uh, because that will make it even, even more obvious uh, what's happening. Any questions? Yeah, 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 and you, you mentioned uh, uh, the IQ of India is 77. Um, that would be below what the IQ of blacks is in the United States. Um, would a solution to the problem of India be... Um, uh, different breeding patterns, so to speak. Um, obviously, um, uh, let's say under Malthusian conditions, when lots of people uh, die away, uh, then you have uh, eugenic conditions. Uh, the, the brighter people, their kids survive, the dumber people, their kids will die. Um, do you see any um, efforts, any insight on the part of the population that they have to uh, implement some eugenic policies and avoid dysgenic policies? And the second somewhat related question is that we do have quite a few very successful Indian people in the, uh, the high-tech industry in the United States. Um, so how do you estimate um, yeah, the proportion of Indians that obviously must exist um, that are capable of of learning Western civilization and striving in the same direction. Okay. So, firstly, about uh, you know, as with uh, whatever is elsewhere, what is happening elsewhere in the world, all government policies are dysgenic policies. So they encourage intelligent people to not have children, and they encourage uh, less intelligent people to have children. That is true around the world. The same is happening in India. So the population is becoming dumber rather than more intelligent. Uh, I think the solution, and this is coming, I think, within the next one or two decades in India, Malthus, Mal, Thomas Malthus will come and Darwin will come to visit India one of these days and wipe out 90 to 95% of the population. Uh, remember, uh, Indian population and population of a lot of third world countries is about uh, 15 to 20 times as much as these countries has had populations before the arrival of Europeans. So 19 out of 20 people in these countries owe their lives to European medicine, European technology, European institutions. None of those things work in these countries anymore. So uh, 
European institution has been completely appended. This is all corruption and bribery. That's all that happens. So, and urban centers, which were centers to bring in intelligent people to work together, have become slum areas because government is all about corruption. So, uh, I, I don't see, uh, I, I see a Thomas Malthus working full time, uh, in a, starting to work full time in India at one point of time. The only reason countries like India are sustainable today is because they, they are told by America what to do. Uh, one day, America will no longer be able to use its whip and say to Indian government, don't kill Muslims or don't do, uh, kill people in, in the northeastern part of the country. Once America is no longer in a position to make that phone call to the Indian government, uh, Malthu Thomas Malthus will kick in right away. Uh, and I think it's already happening. Deindustrialization is in progress in the country. And I know what I'm saying goes very contradictory to what the Western media tells you, but actually there's a deindustrialization happening in the country. People are moving back to rural areas right now because there are no jobs available. And if the jobs are available, they are at such a low salary that you can't afford to live in urban areas. So firstly, Malthus will solve some of the problem, but that will mean 90 to 95% of the population disappearing in that country. Um, uh, you, you said the second thing about uh, intelligence, improving the intelligence, which is the problem today is that uh, India is a very multi-ethnic society. Uh, the caste system is more of a racial system from what I see than a, a, caste, a real caste system. Uh, what has been happening in India for the last, um, uh, last one century is that the smartest people have ten tended to leave the country. Uh, the, the low IQ people, which is maybe 80 to 90 percent of the population, uh, when you interact with them, you realize, you start to wonder how they manage to walk straight. Okay, no, this is, this is a real problem. This is a real Malthusian problem because they, are, they can't produce anything. If I ask my maid to clean, this, uh, to clean up a cup and bring it to me, it will, have, uh, it will be full of thumbprints. I will, ask, I will show it to her, can you actually clean it properly so that the thumbprints are not there? She cannot do it. It will simply not register in her mind. In the modern age, it simply does not work. 70 to 80 to 90 percent of Indians are unproductive in the modern days. So Malthus will kick in. The smartest people have left the country. British handed over the rule of the country to some of the smarter people by Indian standards. Um, now the smarter people are leaving the country very rapidly. The situation is such that today I don't even consider corruption to be the real problem of the country. When I go to meet a bureaucrat or a politician in, in India, and I have done it recently, I actually really think sometimes, am I talking with a chimpanzee? Uh, because, no, I'm, I'm not exaggerating at all. This, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, because what has happened since 1991 is that because of uh, in IT technology, best Indians have, instead of going to work for the government, they have started to move abroad or they start to work for multinational companies or private companies. So the government of India has gone completely brain dead. Uh, so, uh, uh, so now you're talking about some of the very smart people working in the IT industry in, in the United States. Uh, there are two, two responses to that. One is that the very best people of India leave the country. Uh, India, one out of five people in the world is an Indian. So you can expect 10 or 15 geniuses in that country. There's no, nothing strange about it. Uh, you will actually, on a per capita basis, find something similar among uh, other communities of 75, 77 IQ. But remember, the dispersion of IQ is very wide in, in India because it's a multi-racial country, multi-ethnic country. So there are people who are actually very smart in that country. And they are the people you are talking about. But also, 
these IT administrators, IT CEOs of Indian, uh, of American companies is still bring an Indian mindset to the US, which is what you saw with, let's say, the Agrawal who ran Twitter. He wanted to ban everyone from Twitter. The lady who was the lawyer uh, in Twitter, she was creating all kinds of uh, anti-liberty policies in Twitter. So these people don't bring in values that are in sync with the Western culture and they will, like termite, destroy the Western values by making those micro compromises that you cannot see at surface, but they are making compromises, they are infringing on your liberty in very subtle ways. Uh, and you know, talk about social media, a lot of social media control offices are now based in India and they, um, they restrict your freedoms in many ways. So, uh, so that would be my response to it. Uh, you, uh, uh, 10, 20 people being CEOs of IT companies is mainly a reflection that India is such a hellhole, such a screwed up place that the best people just leave that country. Jayant, I've, I've never been to India, so I can hardly claim to be an expert on Indian affairs, but of course, yes. I've never been to India, and so I can't claim to be any kind of expert on Indian affairs. It's just that the overall statistics of India's economic performance do show that the Indians must be doing something right. The country is becoming richer. You, you can see improvements, at least if you look at India on the television. It can't be as bad as you say it is. There must be a positive side. And, and bear in mind that India has been the home to one of the great world civilizations that the people you describe can hardly have created anything as remarkable as you see in India. So th there must be a positive side to your case. So in my talk, I talked about uh, the fact that I did not really understand the deeper meanings of loyalty and honesty and truth until I started living in the United Kingdom. Um, I would t tell Mr. Gab that uh, Western people use the word civilization too flippantly. India is not a civilization. India was never a civilization. Uh, civilization is, you use the word civilization when people have emerged out of their animalistic instincts. India exists in a cesspool of animalistic instincts. Now, I provided what, you, what sounds like a depressing portrayal of India. India is actually far worse than that. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in a relatively well-off family. Uh, my family was very well connected politically, so we were very safe. Um, so uh, I don't, uh, you know, uh, my family members, for example, weren't raped and the rapist wants, wasn't uh, sitting celebrating the rape with the local police officer, which is actually a regular thing in that country. So I haven't suffered those things directly. I'm only telling you what I s see of India from my air-conditioned chauffeur-driven car. So I am providing you a very liberal limousine uh, version, which actually sounds depressing, but the reality is far more depressing. Now, you talk about Indian uh, uh, economics, economy doing very well. Uh, I have been hearing that for the, all my life, that India is now the elephant which is waking up. India has been, is an elephant that is waking up. What is the GDP per capita of India? $2,500 per capita. That is nothing. Now, uh, if it grows by, let's say, 10%, it adds $250 per year to per capita. Uh, Chinese economy of $15,000 per capita, if it grows by 2%, adds more in absolute terms than uh, Indian economy does. American economy with $60,000 per capita, if it grows by 1%, it actually, in absolute value, to, uh, grows by four times that of Indian economy. But here is another mistake people make about judging these countries uh, on the basis of short-term 
growth uh, numbers. Short-term growth numbers can be firstly manipulated, but more importantly, if the sh growth is really so good, why is the Indian economy only doing at 2,500 GDP per capita? Now, graduating, graduating from 2,500 GDP per capita to 10,000 10, requires a leap. A, a people who can't keep, you know, who make $4 an hour cleaning cups cannot graduate into doing secretarial jobs, for example. So India is simply not prepared in terms of its skills to get to that level. The last thing is that this 8.4%, which is the uh, declared GDP growth rate of India, is all fake. Um, uh, the, the, there's manipulation. It is not discounting and adjusting for inflation proper, pro properly. The Indian inflation rate is about 6 to 7 percent, whereas government is discounting, inflate, uh, correcting the GDP for re in, into real terms by using a, a, a discounting factor of, I think, only 1.5 percent. Um, another thing is that uh, India is benefiting hugely by uh, bringing in Russian oil and sending it to Europe. I think it adds up to about $50 billion a year. Uh, now, that 2 or 3% of GDP is not a real GDP. It's, it's just exploiting this strange European behavior that it, it is happy to buy Russian oil via India rather than buying it directly from Russia. The key to understand the economic growth of India is to look at the industrialization of India. Now, is there anyone in this room which has anything from undergarments to your shoes to whatever which is made in India? None. You are either wearing, you are either wearing made in made in Vietnam or made in China or made in Vietnam, uh, Philippines. Indian workforce is so unproductive that I like to say that an Indian organization of two people has one person too many. They simply don't work. They simply don't work. So I. I go to India quite often, although not so much in the last one year. I go to India quite often. India has really become uh, an unsafe country now. It, the tyranny is increasing rapidly in that country, and I'm cutting down my visits. Um, so I, I look around and I say, every product I see is made in China. So what are Indians doing? Uh, I don't see anything that India is really producing. Now, the last thing is, what is 2,500 GDP per capita? You sit in, at, the, at the bottom of an apple tree, apple tree gives you $2,500 worth of apple tree, apples without having to do anything. So, you know, this is really raw, very basic um, economic situation, and most of the growth of Indian I, uh, uh, GDP can be traced back to the internet revolution which happened, which enabled some of the back office work to be transferred to India. But there's a limit to how much you can do it. And that is why I think India is actually not only gr not growing right now, it will, it will actually start falling off the cliff at some point of time because the whole institutional system has fallen apart. Just a go. <clears throat> I find your description of India very interesting. It made me think of the novels by Robert Sheckley, who was a science fiction writer. Uh, he was, I think, very libertarian leaning. And there is a novel by Robert Sheckley where he describes a society on another planet where they don't have any moral standards, where killing and, and uh, stealing is normal, is okay. And but what he says uh, is this, uh, w w this was a, a prison colony where the criminals from the earth were sent to this distant planet. And at a certain point, they take over and they go back to the earth. And so they decivilize the, the earth which sent them there in this prison planet. I think what is happening in, in European countries is we are experiencing a progressive decivilization. And the causes are very clear. I would uh, say one basic cause is central banks because the quest for money is what has destroyed completely the moral basis of uh, Western civilizations. We are s still the heirs to, to a Western civilization which is crumbling and collapsing 
more and more. So I think the lesson from India is very interesting to us because we are on the path to becoming a, a society, societies without a moral compass, without, uh, without values. Uh, sorry, I need to ch challenge you a little bit. Now, I don't know India, I know the Middle East and I know South Africa. Uh, and uh, if you, and even I think I know some of the UK, I think if you extrapolate from British politics, Middle Eastern politics, South African politics, and average people or the British underclass, uh, I think you wonder how is anything working at all? And uh, I think the only answer to that, how is anything working, is that we tend to underestimate the two factors I mentioned when I talk about Switzerland, uh, as the catalectic and the technological factor. Uh, uh, I think uh, IQ, individual IQ has become a bit less important as uh, uh, we are more connected, it's more collaborative, it's more catalectic in a sense, uh, uh, so you have more of division of labor uh, that allows for even uh, people with cognitive uh, challenges to participate uh, in that uh, global uh, uh, Miracle. I mean, it's a miracle that so many people are surviving. If, if, if you look at politics uh, worldwide, if, if you look at, at the structures uh, that we're seeing, if you look at the mindsets of people, if you look at the process of decivilization, obviously civilization is uh, something that takes a constant effort. Uh, and uh, if this effort can't be done anymore, then of course it will gradually uh, decivilize. But still, I think you're underestimating that the miracle that has uh, why hasn't Meltos worked yet? Why are billions uh, surviving? And I think uh, that's uh, international uh, cooperation, it's the revolution in logistics, the uh, internet revolution, uh, revolution in agriculture as well, the immense productivity increases. Uh, uh, so I, I, I tend uh, to think that your picture is, is much too negative. As much as I, I uh, sympathize with this fr frustration potentially uh, as well, and, and of course, uh, I, I think if I was British, I, I was talking like uh, Switzerland from a point of view of frustration. If you're British, I think you should see and be terrified how crumbling uh, British culture, and of course, Sean uh, hardly agrees. Uh, I assume that the uh, UK will not be the shining example to which to hold India to. But also, it, I mean, it, it reduces a bit the gloom, I think, because uh, you must assume, okay, wow, it's a miracle. Even despite <laughs> this civilization, despite uh, the kind of politics we see, still people manage to survive and, and things are working and there's still planes flying in India and Africa and all, all around the world and uh, still somehow the colorists end up uh, where they are supposed to be uh, and, and uh, I am following their a bit high egg, maybe then we tend to underestimate these uh, invisible forces uh, here which I would call, call the catalytic or technological, technological forces. And they still have the railways in India. So, so I, I go to Delhi often and I take a flight to Bhopal, which is uh, six hours by train and two hours by flight. Um, and I, you know, it's much easier to take a train because, uh, you know, you don't have to suffer the check-in, check-out, security, etc. And the airports are very much outside the city, so I would have preferred taking the train. But uh, Mr. Gab, try buying a train ticket from New Delhi to Bhopal. Um, you, you bribe, you, you suffer humiliation by the ticket officer before you can get a ticket. If at all, you can get a ticket without paying a bribe. So uh, train, train traveling is horrendous in the country, but any site in India is horrendous. Um, now, I, Rahim, I completely agree with you that uh, connectivity has improved, productivity has improved, um, synchronization of the people has improved over the last two, three decades. And that is why Indian economy grew from $700 per capita to $2,500 per capita. But I told you about something that my grandmom told me, that some people should be allowed, not that I want to keep them at the edge of starvation, but they should be allowed to stay at the edge of starvation. The problem is that there are people who stay focused if they don't have food on the table for, the, for that evening. If you have food on the table for that evening, troubles, they start, they have time to create troubles particularly those kind of people who don't have the concept of ideas. Um, now, lacking a concept of ideas have, and having too much time on hand creates massive social conflicts. And that is what you saw in Pakistan. 
That is what you are seeing already in India, inside India. It might not still be covered in the Western media, but there are massive social conflicts increasing in the country. Uh, the Khalistan movement is picking up pace in Canada. They are creating a massive ruckus in, in Canada. The Hindu nationalists are fighting with Khalistani morons in Canada. They all fight with each other, creating a chaos in Canada. Within India, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh problem is continuing to increase. Uh, there has been a never stopping problem with Kashmir. And now, northeastern part of India has become very unstable. Increasingly, more and more Indian areas are talking about secession. There's no constitutional provision for secession in that country. And every Indian wants to control your life. I mean, I, uh, any Indian you know, I sit down with him, he will tell me, Jayanth, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. He wants to run my life. So India is a very fake agglomeration of regions who don't fit in together. Indian, Indian prosperity is leading to massive social conflicts and these will is emerge more, uh, more uh, visually in the next few years. Indian family structure has got completely broken up. Uh, women file fake rape cases all the time. Uh, the, the, this is a strange oxymoronic uh, uh, marital rape uh, is becoming a very talked about issue. Um, and the women sue men for all kinds of things in that country. Their husbands, they, every case filed with the police is a fake case. So family system has broken up in that country. A country where family system actually was at one point of time when I moved to the United Kingdom better than it was in the United Kingdom. But that family system was enforced by the British. Given the Indian institutional control, that family system has gone out of the window now. That is in the garbage bin. There's no family structure. There is a term uh, among the people who use English in New Delhi, happy smiley families. Now, I don't know if other people understand what that might mean, but happy smiley families are Indian families who look very happy outside their homes. They go inside their houses and they fight. So, so, so uh, Indian family structure has become uh, completely destroyed. So uh, again, I agree with you, Rahim, that in the last three decades, things have improved because of what you suggested, which were all fruit of Western civilization, but that has also enabled social crises to emerge, most partly because uh, you know, people have too much free time, but also because there's no concept of the rule of law in that country. Absolutely none. You can go to any police officer and the only thing he asks you is, what is the bribe and what is the connection? That's the only two questions he's interested in. So uh, social uh, uh, crisis is going to continue to be uh, become bigger. I used to go to India three or four times a year. Now I haven't been back for a year because things are really scary increasingly and tyranny is increasing very rapidly in that country. So it, w it, it would be a perfect place for adventurers to go, right? <laughs> I, I actually tell all, all young guys to go to India because uh, it's a hassle-prone country, but it's reasonably safe, uh, and it educates you about things that you can never be educated about living in an urban atmosphere where everything works. So Western mind, I think, has become dull because electricity is always there, water is already, always there, heating is always there. It would be always a good thing for a young guy to spend, some, guy, not girl, uh, to go to India and spend some time to uh, really understand what life can be like. Um, given the very vivid image we just got of India and uh, uh, many cultural and ethnic similarities with uh, the, the region, do you have any insights about the rest of the sub subcontinent and uh, whether other countries uh, in, in the region are doing worse or better and why? Sorry, you're saying uh, if I have any understanding about how culturally similar other countries... No, no, no. How, how, uh, how other countries in the subcontinent are, are faring compared to the, the image you painted of India? Well, they, the are, the, they are the same the people. When I use the... Actually, I said that a couple of times uh, in my talk as well, that uh, India is the grandfather of the third world countries, and 26% of the world population lives in the third world. 
I have traveled to a hundred countries. I have traveled a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. I've traveled in Latin America a lot. I've traveled to virtually every uh, Asian country. Um, th th um, th Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, uh, Indians, just because there's a political bo border does not change anything. Their religions don't change, uh, don't change um, the practicalities on the ground either. Uh, they are the same people. Uh, they are uh, a chaotic bunch of people without values who, uh, who have only one focus, which is material resource acquisition, which is, comes down to money, power, and sex. Uh, Sri Lanka is a better version of India, but it's still Sri Lanka is $3,500 uh, per capita income, and it is already facing a lot of social crisis because free time with certain amount this kind of people creates social conflicts. My grandmom was correct there. I, I would like to uh, ask you one short question and then one, one, one uh, point also. So the short question is if uh, Indians have uh, smartphones, like in ev like every country in Africa almost, it's like 100% is the same case in India? That everybody in the countryside has uh, also kids or teenagers have a smartphone? Yeah, so uh, smartphones are very common. Chinese made if, uh, smartphones have brought in a revolution in, in the country. Uh, data is extremely cheap in India. Uh, Pornhub is uh, supposed to supply the most data to Indians and Pakistanis on, on per capita basis and on uh, absolute basis as well. So. Uh, IT has done, uh, you know, 20 years back, people were talking that IT would educate the world, the third world people. But no, they refuse to get educated. They, they are underpinning irrationality and materialism and hedonic, hedonistic character is, is used as a leverage, uh, gets leveraged by IT. So now uh, WhatsApp is, is a big thing in India. What, what happens? They, Pornography has increased by leaps and bounds. Um, uh, exchange of superstitious materials is, has gone off the charts in that country. So uh, instead of getting uneducated, they are getting uneducated uh, in the real sense, if that responds to your question. And, and also one point uh, regarding the GDP. Uh, I can imagine that, for example, when in countryside some, somebody has a plot with the clay or with the mud, he can make uh, his own uh, bricks and to give it to some uh, uh, neighbor, which is uh, something which not appears in the GDP. So, but the but the house is constructed and uh, it's somehow uh, it's it's uh, it's not only that the GDP is a big or small, but such such activities are not in GDP and it's it's somehow good and natural. Well, so I, I don't think that's how uh, GDP is calculated, but uh, there are more ec better trained economists here. I'm not an economist. Uh, what India does is, and this, this is another problem with Indian uh, GDP growth rate. Uh, what happens is that uh, a proportion of GDP is supposed to be informal sector, which is not, does not get registered with the government, and a part of the economy is supposed to be the formal sector. Let's say it's 50-50 for India, 50% informal sector, 50% formal sector. What Indian government does basically in very uh, simple terms is doubles the formal sector GDP to calculate the overall GDP. So I think the informal sector GDP gets incorporated in GDP, but it, in a different way. What they do is they do a survey of how much of the uh, how much of the economy is informal sector and how much of that is the formal sector. Now the last survey that India did was more than a decade back. In the last decade, they have destroyed the informal sector, but they are still imagining using the old survey that the informal sector is a certain ratio of the formal sector. So that by itself greatly exaggerates the GDP of the informal sector. Uh, and hence, uh, that's another problem with the Indian GDP uh, situation. You know, I have never seen the kind of beggars I see today in India. Uh, I've, I had not seen those un since 1980s. There are far more beggars, far more orphans in that country today than there were 20, than there, 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 was, there were in the intervening two, three decades. 
people are extremely poor. Uh, they, they are now want to work for you for whatever you offer them. Two, three dollars a day, they will work 12 hours for you. But of course, their productivity is virtually negligible. Uh, I, I have a question for, for uh, Philip Bagos. Uh, so you've, you reported on the crime of, of the COVID policies. How likely uh, is it that these policies be repeated? Certainly there will be attempts. So how likely is it and what are the top two or three things that you uh, can think of that, that should be done from a libertarian point of view to prevent that it be repeated? Well, that's of course very difficult to predict. Of course, uh, it's an incentive of, of the ruling class to try, try it again and they tried this this international agreement uh, through the WHO, and people forget. Yeah? So, so this is the reason why I said you you should never forget. So this would be the first thing: um, never forget, and uh, also ask for ask for yeah for punishment or for investigation who was responsible for it for the cover up. Yeah, in Germany we have the RKI files that came out, so never forget, uh, uh, so, so it doesn't repeat itself. Yeah, we say this in Germany about the Second World War, yeah, there must be this remembrance um, culture. Um, I personally think it will be much, much more difficult to repeat it, because for many people, uh, for myself, the, the level for, uh, for uh, resistance will be reached much earlier. I I waited like six weeks until I uh, started to violate the rules. <laughs> but next time I will not wait so long, and I hope many other people either. And I think many people um, learned that they, yeah. I, I mean, it was a great experience for for learning for all of us. Yeah, that we have to to stop it in the in the very beginning. Yeah, and I think many people um, woke up. So I really think it will be much more difficult to re repeat it than it was the first time. Hmm. Just a few remarks from the legal point of view. There are, in fact, uh, except the pandemic treaty, which failed at the last uh, General Assembly of the WHO, but it's up again for the next General Assembly, and they will go on trying with the, with the pandemic treaty until they push it through. This is the normal way of behavior of these international organizations. Plus, last May, they uh, approved the modifications of the international health rules, which is bad as well. On the other side, uh, the European Union already anticipated everything that is on the, on the plan for the WHO because we have a number of directives uh, which were enacted in 2021 and 2022 which anticipate the same thing. So interconnectedness of all uh, health authorities, which is already crazy that you have health authorities, um, uh, approved laboratories, uh, enhanced testing and uh, common response against these uh, these so-called threats. So what I see is that that the the establishment and the unholy alliance between pharmaceutical uh, industry and big government is going on on the same agenda. What we should do, and the only thing we could do, is enhance civil disobedience. So uh, in 2020, most people were stunned by what was happening and most people believed what they were telling you on TV. It was obviously fake from since the beginning. But uh, that I agree with Philip. Probably lots of people have woken up and I think the main issue is civil disobedience. The next mask mandate Let's go out on the street without a mask, everyone. The next vaccine mandate, we should disobey. Uh, it is important that we perceive the power, that 
the common people has. It's it's the lesson of Etienne de la Boissie. Uh, it's it's a voluntary servitude. We just need to say no to all these policies, and the whole uh, castle of cards crumbles. But it needs uh, a very uh, thorough work of information because what is happening now, you see it. They try to sweep everything under the rug. It's forgotten, forgiven. We have, we are on another page. There are lots of distractions, wars, uh, climate change, or whatever. We need to stay focused on these on these policies and be ready for a, a much harder season of, of civil disobedience and of public rallies and protests and so on. It will be hard. It's not that they just uh, say, okay, it's, it's, uh, it's off. We tried it. We made lots of money in 2021, 22, and now it's, it's over. They will go on because th as usual, the, the, the main aim is to get lots of money from the people. Uh, the, the transfer of money from the poorest strata and from the taxpayers to these industries through a policy of privilege, this is the, the, the very definition of fascism. It's the alliance between big government and big industry, especially uh, pharmaceutical industry. And it's laughable. There, there are people who say, yes, these are private businesses. This is not private businesses. This is a, a Parasite who uses government policies to line their pockets with money, with, with ill-gained money, which is just uh, stealing and, and thievery. Thank you. We are discussing the bottomless wickedness of the British and American ruling classes, which imposed this fake pandemic on us and these very iffy vaccines. But I do feel compelled to come back to the point that Jayant is making. I've just checked on my telephone and eBay, eBay exists in India. Now eBay only functions on the basis of trust. I know that because I buy and sell on eBay and if, if Jayant's very gloomy judgment of India is wholly correct, it would be impossible for a high trust institution like eBay to function in India. It, it can't be as bad as you say it is. I accept that the Indian government, the Indian ruling class, is corrupt and wicked, but governments and ruling classes are always very wicked. We, we, don't need to, we don't need to think too hard about that, but I, I, do, keep, but I, I do insist that something in, in India must be going in the right direction, and there must be some degree of trust, because everything you say about India contradicts my own general experience of Indian people in England. It can't be quite as you say. I, I do agree that I've never been to India. I've never thought very hard about India. It's just that I'm not entirely convinced. <laughs>